you good morning journey it's easter happy easter welcome to journey so this is one of the biggest weekends of the year so if there's even a single seat to the inside of you in a row take it there's no buffer seats today so go ahead and move on in and stand and worship together
You can all be seated. This next song is one that a group of us wrote here in this room about two months ago, and it was uh, written as it's the story of Jesus, his whole life, death and resurrection, and then also it's about himself and his character, and we wanted to share that with you this morning for Easter. Pray with me. Father God, we, we want to know you. That's, that's why we're here. We're here to have an encounter with you, to connect with you, uh, with the people that we love and we care about. We're thankful for this Resurrection Sunday that you died for us and that you rose, more importantly, for us, Lord, and we are excited to be here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, happy Easter to everybody. If, if you're on site, I need you to do me a favor. If you're on site and there is an empty chair inside of you from the aisle, would you please slide to that and fill it up so we can open a couple of seats on the aisles. We still have some people in the lobby and in the back that are waiting to come in and grab seats. So if you do that, that would be awesome. If you are joining us online, we are thrilled to have you with us as well. Thanks for joining us this Easter morning. What journey is about. What we want to do on a given weekend is we want to help people take their next steps in their spiritual walk. And there are people that are new to faith or, or even just exploring faith. And we just want to be a place where if you are ready to take a next step that we can help 
And if you've been a believer or a person of faith for decades, you still have those next steps to take. We all have those small next steps to take, and we want to do that. And today, some people are going to take the next step of baptism. And so I wanted to just say, what is baptism? And baptism really simply is just a public declaration. It is a a moment to say publicly something that's already happened inside, where someone has made a decision that they want to follow Jesus, that they are going to commit their lives to obedience, to following, following Christ, following his word, and they're going to take those steps along the way. And baptism is a way for them to say that publicly. And that's just simply what it is and what it's about. And we have a bunch of people that have been planning for several weeks to do that today. And we get to celebrate them, and it's going to be super cool. The one thing we also know, though, is there are some of you that came, up, came today, and you had no intention of being baptized. You had no idea that that might be your next step. But we also know that God works in our lives in the midst of what we're experiencing And we know that God may prompt a number of you to get baptized today. And we want you to know that even if you did not come expecting to do that, and you feel that urge to follow through and be obedient and be baptized today, that we're ready for you. We've been praying for you. We've got clothes in the back that you can change into. We've got towels. We've got everything that you would need if you decide to get baptized today. And as Bob finishes his message, he is going to give you instructions on what you would need to do. And we would just encourage you, if you feel that sense, whether it's through the music or during the message or even as you watch some of the testimonial videos that you'll see shortly, that you would obey that prompting, that you would follow the Spirit's lead and you would go ahead and do that. And you might say, like, is that a little weird? Like, to just like spontaneously get baptized at a church service? Well, I'm gonna take you back to Acts chapter eight. In Acts chapter eight, there's this Ethiopian eunuch. He's a royal official in the Ethiopian court. And he's in, in uh, Jerusalem, probably on business or whatever. And as he's leaving Jerusalem, he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, but he doesn't understand what it says. He's reading it, but he has no idea what it means. And as he's going down the road, he runs into a guy named Philip. Philip is one of Jesus' disciples, one of Jesus' followers. And Philip sits down with this eunuch, and he tells him, what Isaiah means. And then he helps him understand what Isaiah means in light of what had just happened in Jerusalem with Jesus's death and resurrection. And I, uh, Acts chapter eight says this, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So we figure if it's good enough for Jesus' day, then it's good enough for us today. And so if you feel like today you want to get baptized, we would love to embark on that with you and, and engage that with you. So again, Bob will have some instructions at the end to tell you how to do that. And up next is Bob, and he's going to share the word from Philippians. Several years ago, I was uh, sitting at my kitchen table uh, working on a seminary assignment. It was getting kind of later into the evening, really dark outside, and the doorbell rang. And it was kind of disconcerting. It's like, that doesn't normally happen. So I go to the door, and I open it, and I look around. Nothing. Really weird. Really weird. So I go back to my kitchen table. I go back to work. 
Ding dong, nobody. Ding dong, ditchers. And so I get the idea, wouldn't it be fun to actually try to chase them down sometime? So I thought, I don't know if they're gonna be back, but I got on my tennis shoes. I strapped them on like a soldier straps on combat boots. I was gonna go after them, hoping just one more ring. So I'm waiting by the door. Ding dong, boom, I was out the door, jumped off of the porch, the chase was on. But here's the thing that you don't think about. When you're at your kitchen table with the bright lights, your eyes are adjusted to that, and then suddenly you're running in the pitch black through your yard, and you can't see anything. You just kind of see these forms in front of you. I just remember seeing a tree that just like went by me, and I start to think about, like, what if I hit a tree, and like, what's it going to cost to fix an ACL? You start thinking about those things when you're a little bit older, but I, I, there was so much adrenaline, I thought, I've got to catch them. Well, they were running together for a while, but then they split a big one went this way and a little one went this way. I went after the little one. I'm no dummy. I went after the little one. And I was gaining and I was gaining and I was, and I was, and I was just, this was just for fun. I wasn't angry in any way. And I just thought, I've got to catch them. And I remember thinking, I don't want to tackle them. So I'm just going to try to reach out my hands. And my depth perception was really bad because it was dark. I'm just going to reach out my hands and try to get his shoulders well, as soon as I did that, boom, I fall to the ground. But luckily, when I went down, I actually hit the back of his legs, knocked him to the ground, <laughs> rolled him. And then I thought, I can't let him get away. So I scrambled as fast as I could, and I got on top of him. I caught my first ding-dong ditcher. I don't know what it's like to get your first elk, but it, it probably kind of <laughs> felt. It probably kind of felt like that. It was pretty cool for me. But I'll tell you one thing, that little guy did not want to be caught. He was on the run. Silly story, but I've actually got a serious question for you. Are you running from God? When you think about where you're at in your life right now, are you running from God? And I don't want you to answer that question too quickly because this is what I believe to be true. I believe that you can be running from God and not even know it. In the first century, there was a man named Saul, Saul of Tarsus, and he was running from God, and he had absolutely no idea that he was running from God because he was respectable, he was even religious. He was a pillar of the religious community, but he was on the run from God, and he didn't realize it until he met Personally, the resurrected Jesus. Here's Paul's story, Acts chapter nine. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Now would be a question that was gonna mark Saul's life for the rest of his life. Saul, who we'll later know as the Apostle Paul. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The response, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Now here's what I know, is that if you would have asked even Paul himself, are you running from God? He would have said, no way. I am not running from God. I am actually fighting for God. I am on his team. It's these other people out there that are saying blasphemous things about God. They're trying to tell people that God became a man and that he died and he was raised from the dead. They're saying things that are not true about God. Paul had a picture of God. He thought he knew exactly what God was like, but he didn't and he was actually running from God. He had created a picture in his mind of who God was that didn't correspond 
to reality. But here's our problem. We can do the exact same thing as Paul. We can make a picture of God in our mind that fits our reality. We can create an image of God rather than following the actual God of creation. We make him in our image. And what we do is we imagine that there's this God out there that he just happens to like everything that I like. And the things that I dislike, God dislikes those exact same things. The things that I value, those are the things that God values. The things that God wants, they're the things that I want in my life. We create God in our image. Anne Lamott once quipped, you can safely assume you've created a God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. Why would we do this, knowingly or unknowingly? Why would we create a God that doesn't correspond to the God of reality? I've got one word that I believe answers that question, and it's the word comfort. Because God, if God is exactly like us and thinks exactly like us, it's very comfortable. It's like why if I was gonna get a suit tailored to me, I would want it to fit me absolutely perfectly for who I am. Why would I do that? Because it would be comfortable. It never rubs me the wrong way. And we can often do this. That's what we do. We create a God in our image for our comfort. But when we start to have engagements with the real God, the resurrected Jesus, we're gonna find out that there are things that are gonna be really uncomfortable. Jesus is gonna say things to us and call out things in our life that are uncomfortable to us, that we don't always like, that sometimes are scary and even unnerving to us. But that's the kind of God that we need to follow, a God that is willing to challenge us when we need to be challenged, a God that is willing to change us when we need to be changed, to challenge the way we think and to challenge the way that we behave. Because if we aren't wrestling, friends, if we're not wrestling daily with a God like that, we've just created in our minds some kind of a one-dimensional, fictional God that we created rather than the Lord of heaven, the resurrected Jesus that actually created us. We've got to wrestle with the God that we are willing to listen to him when he says things to us that we actually don't even want to be true because it's challenging to our lives because it's only then, friends, that we will believe him when he says things to us that we find too good to be true. When he says things to us like, I love you. When he says things to us like, I forgive you. When he says things to us, when the resurrected Jesus would look at us and say, I would rather give my life and pay the penalty for your sin than to spend eternity apart from you. Things that just could sound too good to be true. We've got to believe him when he says the hard things and when he tells us the good things. And that's what happened for Saul. His picture in his mind of who he thought God was was completely blown up on that day, in that one moment. And Paul's question is the best question ever. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And that's the question that shaped Paul's entire life. He wanted to know the answer to that question. He didn't care about this picture of God that he had built up in his mind. He wanted to know the real God, the resurrected Jesus. And that question drove and shaped all the days of his life. And much later in his life, Paul wrote what this Easter text from Philippians chapter three that I'm gonna read to you. Here's what Paul said. He says, I want to know Christ. I wanna know Christ. I want that question answered. Who are you, Lord? I want to know the Lord personally. Yes, he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. He wanted to meet the resurrected Jesus and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him, in his death, and so somehow, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul believed, after meeting the resurrected Jesus, that if this is true, if Jesus truly did raise from the dead, if that is an actual event of human history, it changes everything. This is the pinnacle of human history. 
Did Jesus raise from the dead? Because Paul would say in other writings that if this didn't happen, he said Christians, followers of the way, should be pitied above all people. What Paul would say is if this didn't happen, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we are wasting our time. But he met the resurrected Jesus and it changed everything for him. He started to experience the power of the resurrected life and it changed everything. Our lives, when we meet the resurrected Jesus, everything will change. The way we see people and the way we see relationships will never be the same because every person that you will ever encounter on this earth, when you look at them, you would know they are incredibly valuable because they are made in God's image. They are worthy of respect because they're made in God's image. It would change the way we leverage our wealth and our power. It wouldn't be something that we would just try to accumulate for ourselves, but we would actually think about how do I use wealth and power for the sake of others, to lift others up? Our mindset would change. It would change the way we see our job. Our job wouldn't just be this thing that we go to, this grind that we go to every day just to pay the bills, but we would be thinking about how can I leverage my time and my life and this occupation to actually serve and to love and to care for the people of this world? It would change the way we think about our sexuality and how we use our sexuality. We would bring that up under the lordship of Jesus. We would start to see that through his eyes. It would change the way we think about race relations in this world. Because when we think about it, friends, John gives us this picture of eternity. He talks about there will be this day when people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are gonna be gathered around the throne worshiping God. This, this picture of incredible unity in the midst of diversity. And our call as followers of Jesus, followers of the resurrected Jesus, is to bring that kingdom to this earth. That that, universe, that unity and diversity would be what we would see in and around our lives, that would matter to us. Social justice would matter to us. We would never overlook the marginalized or the needy in this world. They would actually become a focus of ours because they were the focus of Jesus as well. Everything in our life would change. That's what Paul wants us to know. That's what it means to live the power of his resurrected life. But nothing, I believe, changed more in the Apostle Paul's view than how he thought about his personal relationship and connection to Jesus himself. I want us to think back to that little interaction that Paul had on the Damascus Road when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus the one you are persecuting. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say, you are persecuting them, meaning those ones. But he's telling Paul, you are persecuting me. There was a picture that Jesus put from the very beginning into the mind of the apostle Paul that shaped his life and it shaped his theology. It shaped everything in terms of how he even wrote the letters of his body. He talked over and over about this union that there is between Jesus and his followers. The union that would be so close that if anything is happening to them, Jesus would say, it's happening to me. And this reality that anything then that is true about Jesus is true about those who are followers of him. It's what Paul would write over 150 times in his letters, this idea that we are in Christ, we are in him. There is a union that we have with him. Everything that's true about Jesus is true of us. That is the glory and the beauty of the gospel message. And Paul, in one verse, right before the verses that I just read to you in Philippians, explains this beautifully. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. He says, that I may gain Christ, meaning that I may gain connection to him and be found in him, that idea of union with him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He's saying, my righteousness, my right standing before God doesn't come because I did really well and I handed him this perfect moral record. He's like, that's not 
how it works. That's not how we gain righteousness. But actually the righteousness, it says, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That is the beautiful message of the gospel. What Jesus did, what we talked about on Good Friday when we gathered together here, we talked about that reality that we took our record, our record of sin and guilt and shame and brokenness, and Jesus took that record upon himself, and he paid the penalty for that. He was separated from the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took that upon himself on Good Friday. But what he did was he took his perfect record, his righteous record, and gave that to us. So now when the Father looks at us, it's not a righteousness from the law. Obeying the law is a righteousness that comes from Jesus himself, from God, and is by faith. And faith just simply means that we come to him with our empty, open hands and say, I can't do this on my own. You did this for me. I put my faith, I put my trust, I put my hope in you. A righteousness from God. Here's what I love about the resurrected Jesus is that he is willing to meet people exactly where they're at. Me, you, everyone. And we see that when we look at the very end of the book of John and these interactions that Jesus has with people after his resurrection. I love the story of him meeting Mary Magdalene at the tomb. She was there weeping because the one man that had ever shown her honor and dignity and respect was gone. She was in despair, lost all hope. Jesus met her in her despair and he simply came to her and he said, Mary. He just simply said her name and hope was born. She didn't have to run anymore in her despair. I love how he met Thomas. We remember the story of Thomas. Just like all the other disciples, he saw Jesus die on the cross. But he hears everyone talking about this reality that Jesus is now raised from the dead and he can't conceptualize it. I saw him die and unless I see him alive, I will not believe. He was struggling in doubt and Jesus met him in his doubt. Came to him, not with guilt and shame and blame. He just said, Thomas, touch my hands. See and believe. He met Thomas right where he was. I think about Peter, when he met Peter. One of the last times that Peter saw Jesus was when he denied him three times. And Jesus told him, he told Peter, you're gonna not deny three times that you even know me. What did Peter say? He said, no way, God. These other disciples, they may blow it, but you can count on me. But what did he do when push came to shove? When a little girl even came up to him and said, you were with him, you were one of them. He didn't hide that he ever knew him. Failure, absolute failure to the Lord that he loved. He probably had to wonder, would I ever be welcomed back? Could I ever make it back? But Jesus not only brought him back into relationship, but he gave him a place of honor and said, Peter, you're gonna be one of my greatest spokespeople for who I am and what I've done. He met Peter right where he was in his failure. And then there's Paul. Oh my gosh. Think about Paul. Paul had spent that time dragging Christians out of their home, overseeing their death, their martyrdom. And Jesus meets him right where he's at on the run. And if Paul were here today, he would just say, I don't know what you've done, but Jesus knows what you've done. But if Jesus' grace can find me, Jesus' grace can find you. He met Paul right where he was. Think about this with me, just for a second. Think about this reality. When Paul entered eternity, and there were people cheering him on as he shows up in eternity. Imagine this. Paul was cheered on by people he killed. That's the nature of the gospel. That's the nature of grace. You have never done anything you have never done anything that God's grace can't lift you up and pull you out. God will meet you exactly where you're at. He meets us with exactly 
what we need. His invitation, as always, is just stop running. Stop running. Whether it's despair, life isn't going the way you thought it was. Maybe it's doubt. I just don't know that I can believe this. Maybe it's failure. Like, you don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done, but he does, and he died for it. Maybe it's indifference. I don't know what it is. I don't know what running looks like for you. But the resurrected Jesus says, stop running and come to me in faith. And that's what we get to celebrate today on this resurrection day. We're gonna get to celebrate in baptism people who have stopped running and said, Jesus, I'm gonna identify my life with you. My life has now died with you. I wanna be raised to new life with you. I'm identifying with your death, burial, and resurrection. Lots of people are gonna be doing that today. And here's my question for you. Is today your day? Is now your time? Is there something in you? Is the Holy Spirit touching something in your heart and your life? I'm, we're not gonna do anything to try to twist anybody's arms because you know right now if the Spirit is asking you to step forward in baptism. Here's my ask of you. If you sense that nudging, don't say no. Don't wait Don't sit there and reason and try to talk yourself out of it. Just say yes, stop running. Maybe for some of you, this would be your first place of faith, putting your faith in him. Some of you have placed your faith in him, but you've never followed him in obedience to be baptized. Maybe today is your day. Just wanna let you know we've done everything possible to make this easy for you to do. What we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video here in just a minute. People sharing their stories of how they've stopped running and Jesus met them right where they were at. During that video, if you sense that God is inviting you to be baptized today, I just want you to head right over there where it says get baptized. There'll be people that will meet you there, that will talk to you and pray with you. We've got clothes for you to change into. All I'm asking you to do is just put your yes on the table before our Lord and King. Let's watch this video together. I can look back now and see how and when I started to turn my back on God. I spent the next 20 plus years suffering from mental illness, abusive relationships, and addiction. I often felt alone and empty and like I had nowhere that I could go. I knew that the Lord was there, but I never really felt worthy of his love and mercy and forgiveness. When I thought I wasn't able to go on any longer, I felt this overwhelming presence of the Lord whispering to me, come back to me, I'm here. The Lord has saved me and Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And me and my mom talked about who Jesus really was and how he impacted my life. I love to talk to Jesus because when I do, it makes me feel loved and special. I want to get baptized today to have Jesus forever walk by my side. The first time I actually got a witness, the Lord, was when I went to a youth group with my best friend, Kate. I was doubting how God has never touched my heart in ways he has to others. My leader, Hannah, came up to me asking to pray for me. I started crying, realizing that no one else matters except for God and that there was actually a relationship that I've been looking for. I'm here to get baptized today to show my faith and I am all in for Jesus. I was at summer camp and the pastor there asked us to pray with him to accept Jesus into our hearts and accept him as our savior. Ever since then, I knew I wanted to get baptized, but I've been a little nervous too. I'm excited to get baptized today and publicly declare Jesus as my Lord and savior. Through my teenage years, I stepped away from my faith, um, got into a lot of bad habits. Becoming sober was probably one of the biggest things for me. I learned that it's okay to let my guard down and start feeling my emotions. When I started experiencing signs guiding me back to church, I joined a men's group, a group of guys that are like-minded and openly talk about your faith and following Jesus. Reading the Bible together, it's helped me grow. I'm really looking forward to this journey. My first strong memory of feeling Jesus' presence was when I was about 11 years old during a Christmas Eve service, and that was 50-plus years ago. 
One of my favorite scriptures is Psalms 25, 4. Show me your ways, Lord, and teach me your paths. I want to be baptized to be accept Jesus as my Savior and open my heart to him publicly. I would say I was a lukewarm Christian at best. I knew of him, but I didn't know him. I really only ever prayed when I needed something. I just felt lost constantly. When I met my boyfriend, though, Pete, he showed me how to be a true follower of Jesus and for everything that I do to just have the intention of bringing glory and obeying him. I am so excited to be baptized and declare my faith in Jesus Christ. I really want to get baptized because I already know that God loves me, but I want to show that I know God loves me in front of everyone. And I just think this, that baptism is a genius way to do this. So that's why I want to get baptized. In 2022, I experienced a heavy loss. I did not have hope or faith to hang on to, but I fortunately had a small group of people who were really strong in their faith and they shared prayers and encouragement and wisdom and bestowed patience and unconditional love during a time when I just couldn't deal. I have been continuing to strengthen my relationship with God and finding peace and serenity. I believe that the Lord Jesus is my personal savior. I am beyond grateful. Reading the Bible and praying helps me know who Jesus really is. The light of the world, God in human form, my savior and my friend. Jesus is a good shepherd and I want to be part of his flock. I was attending church almost every Sunday at Journey, listening to the sermons and thinking I understood it. As soon as I walked out those doors, I would find myself living the same old habits. One day, I saw having one of the biggest anxiety attacks in 2023. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Psalms 56.3. This highlighted verse made me realize that I needed to take a deep breath, and God has a plan for each one of us individuals. I'm ready to take this next step in life and get baptized and let God write my story. I'm so excited to get baptized, and I've gone to a journey most of my entire life, and I love God and Jesus. I wish everyone had Jesus in their hearts. May of 2018, I became pregnant with my first child. The doctors told me I should have an abortion due to my health. I knew that that wasn't gonna be an option for me. So I carried her to full term, and I didn't know at the time that she was God's blessing to me and she was exactly what I needed in my life. I've been growing my relationship with God and I am so blessed. When I was 24, I felt a nudge to go to church. I chose to follow Jesus. A year after that service, my brother ultimately passed away from cancer and I knew that nudge had come from God and that he knew that I needed his love and his patience and kindness um, as I was going to be going through that really difficult time of grieving. There was a lot of things that I still held on to to try and control in my life. And in September of last year, I made the decision to be a all-in follower of Jesus and my life has not been the same since. The only way to a new life is to be reborn through him and I get to do that today. So I am very excited. Growing up, I had a difficult time with religion. I blamed it for a lot of things. I mean, I was never really close to God. I started going to church. Every Sunday that we went, I thought I was just being only a good husband, but it was God who was helping us both. It wasn't until I heard the, the parable of the prodigal son, and that's when I knew that God, Jesus will love me no matter what what type of person I was, and that he has a plan for me. I've grown so much with God and Jesus. I read the Bible more. I always wake up knowing that I'm growing as a person, growing in Christ. I have a strong fellowship with a great group of guys. I'm here today to let you know that I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. 
Recently, I fell into a very dark place in my life and was the farthest I've ever been from God and my family. I had to confess to God and myself and my husband all that I had done. I have never felt such a peace and beauty as I did that day and as I have since then. I know God now was there the whole time seeking me. The Lord is my savior and I'm so grateful to be able to be baptized in front of everybody today. We are broken, we are flawed, but in that we can have redemption and love. The day that I chose to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior was absolutely amazing. It gave me a strength I've never seen. And in that, I truly know now what it means to love someone. And in that, you earn a forgiveness and understand a forgiveness that without God would never be fully understood. I struggled a lot with mental health growing up. And I started to try to like really control my life. And that definitely ended up in some really poor choices and decision making. I'd go through periods where I'd be like really close and then I'd just like completely fall away. And I was to the point in my life where I was at my lowest rock bottom. I just fell onto the floor and started begging God to just take away the pain. And I heard him that night. It's like, it's okay. I got you. I'm here for you. I love you. The realization hit me, I think, that the creator of the universe, he loves me. He wants a relationship with me. He chose me, and I am worthy of love. God, my life is yours. I would lean on myself and things of this world. I developed a, a heavy drinking problem. It consumed my life for many years. I thought I could hide it, but really I was dying inside. I lost hope, I lost value, I lost meaning. But thankfully, Jesus was there. I just had to let go and give him my full heart my whole life, not just bits and pieces. Surrender and stop running and stop hiding and let him in to all those places in my life. Through his grace and his mercy, he restored me, he brought me back to life. And now I have hope because I know that I have a God who loves me. That's why I'm here today just to say, Jesus, I choose you. You are my Lord, you are my savior, and you are my rock, my redeemer. My old life is gone. I'm not looking back and I'm moving on to new life in Jesus. We have, uh, we have baptisms now, and uh, we're going to celebrate those together. If you, if God is moving in your heart and you want to get baptized, this is the best time to go now to the, over by the sign, and they will help you get ready for that. Let's stand and worship and celebrate with each baptism. Let's sing out. I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the star Now I am chosen Free and forgiven I have a future it's worth the living. I was made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I? Found enough grace. It's running. 
take credit for the breath in these lungs. My only boast is in the work you have done. This heart's a vessel, and the love that pours out, let it be sweet perfume poured out on you. I give you the glory, all of the glory. I give you the glory again and again. This praise isn't for me. My worship is only to give you the glory. Every song who's worth my reverence And my purest response The name of Jesus High above every other It's all for you Oh, it's all for you I give you the glory All of the glory
All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must stay And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've no one to respond. I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through. 
So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be.
I know, it's like me, when you get a little older, it's, it's a long time to stand, but is there anything more exciting to celebrate than resurrected life in Christ? I don't think so, amen, amen. Just wanna let you know that uh, if you'd like to talk to somebody or have somebody pray with you or for you, we've got some tables at the end of the stage and some people that would love to uh, help you out in any way that you can. I love you, love you, love you, Journey. Have a great resurrection day.